Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name is Mark, and today I've got a very special watch that I'll be servicing. It was sent to me by one of my subscribers who says that the watch is a family heirloom and apparently has a curse and is just generally thought of as a bad luck charm. So as we take a look at the case, it is in very good condition. Usually these raised portions of this design would be worn down with age, but because it was thought of as uh, bad luck to carry it, in this family, it was uh, not used very much and just sat in a drawer. So I'll give it a little wind and see if I can get it to run. I was told that the balance staff seemed to be all right. And while it does run, it doesn't run great. The amplitude seems pretty low. And we can see that the hairspring is outside the regulator pins, uh, so that will have to be addressed. And here we can see the 18K hallmark, which indicates the case is 18 karat solid gold. So this is quite special watch. The crystal is quite scratched and the owner would like it replaced. So I'll remove that now and order a new one. And I really like the gold hands. They are in really good shape. There are two case screws and the winding stem and crown holding the movement into the case, so I'll remove those. And the dial is also held in by two retaining screws on the dial feet. That's kind of an unusual dial washer. They are normally made out of metal, but oh well. And then there's the hour wheel and the minute wheel. And here's where we run into our first bit of trouble. 
I try to remove the cannon pinion with my new old cannon pinion remover, but after several tries, I just can't get it off. So I resort to my old method of using the hand remover levers. But this cannon pinion is so smooth that there's nothing to grip onto. I've never come across a cannon pinion that has been so stuck like this. Now, I'm sure many of you are yelling at me right now, and yep, I broke it. So, at the time, I had no idea that this cannon pinion was actually press fit onto the center wheel, and no amount of prying was ever going to get it off. So, I'm going to have to find a cannon pinion to replace this one, and I'm sure it's really not going to be easy. But, let's press on. I need to remove the balance assembly to keep it safe. And because of the way it is recessed into the movement, I also have to remove the cock that holds down the escape wheel. So I'm now removing the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel. And as I do, you may have noticed that the teeth on both of these wheels are curved and not straight like we normally see. This is called wolf teeth, and it's typically found on more high-end Swiss movements. It's kind of unusual, and that's actually one of the ways I tracked down a replacement cannon pinion for this watch. So as I continue disassembling the movement, I want to talk a little bit more about the history of the watch. The owner wrote this. This watch survived both world wars, right in the northern part of France, where we come from. And I know my family was never rich. They went through a very hard time during World War II, yet this stayed in the family and was not sold. I remember and read that generations ago, before World War I, this side of the family was pretty wealthy. 
But then some side got less lucky, and this is one of the artifacts of that time. Unfortunately, we do not live in France anymore. Most of the side of my family is gone, and I only have those memories. You know, it really makes you stop and think the history that these old pocket watches have seen. It is such a testament to the level of workmanship and care that has gone into the manufacture of this and many old watches that they have not only survived for so long, but that they actually still work and look as amazing as they do. I feel very honored to be working on such a cherished heirloom from the owner's family. So I've removed the barrel bridge and I'm in the process of taking off the finger bridges to expose the train of wheels. So in addition to the wolf's teeth, here's another little difference that I ran into. The pallet fork is made to fit around the staff of the escape wheel. So in effect, it acts like the banking pins found on later movements. So I'll need to remove the pallet bridge and, well, there it goes.
and then I can remove the pallet fork along with the escape wheel, fourth wheel, and the barrel. This plate contains many of the hole jewels and cap jewels from the bottom of the movement. So before I run all the parts through the parts cleaner, I want to take a minute and remove as much dirt, gunk, and old lubrication with a piece of pegwood. This not only results in cleaner parts, but it also helps keep the cleaning and rinsing fluids that I use in the machine fresher for longer. And as I'm cleaning, I'm also inspecting. And like right here, I actually found a broken capsule. You can see the crack goes almost right through the center line of the jewel, so you know that's going to have an effect on retaining proper lubrication of the pivot above it. So this will need to be replaced for sure. So I'll just continue with the pre-clean, and although the movement is dirty, I wouldn't call it filthy. So now I'll just load the baskets and put them through the cleaning machine.
here's the entire movement, all clean and dry and ready for repairs, relubrication, and assembly. So I think I'll begin by replacing the cap jewel. I, I've already measured and ordered a replacement jewel. And then I'll just remove the broken jewel with my clone Horia tool. I've also done this in a previous video, a little more detailed. So if you want to see that video, then I will leave a link to it in the description. So once I got the old jewel out, since this is what's called a rub-in jewel, I'll have to open up the hole a little bit. And for that, I'll be using a new old tool that I bought just for this job. Like I said, it opens up the hole a bit and smooths out the lip that will eventually be rubbed back down to hold the jewel in place. I think you'll get the idea as you see it work. Now with it opened up, you can see the bottom lip that the jewel fits on top of. I need to make sure it's clean, so I'll use some peg wood and lighter fluid to get it ready for the new cap jewel. Then I'll just use the Horia tool again and press the new one into place. And with it in place, I'll use this tool, which has a cupped inner portion, which will round over that upper metal lip of, uh, above the jewel and hold it secure. So before I put the cap jewel back in place, I want to remove the other two jewel settings and clean underneath them 
before adding new lubrication and putting them back in place. So you'll probably notice that the jewel is a different color, but that's merely cosmetic. That is just how modern jewels are made. And for this, I use Mobius 9010. I think it's pretty interesting that uh, you can see an X scratched over one of the other jewels. I think that was made by a previous watchmaker to indicate another broken jewel that was eventually replaced. This is just my opinion, but if you want to mark a jewel to be replaced, I would suggest using a Sharpie marker and then removing that mark with some later fluid when you're finished. So I'll start the reassembly of the watch with the train of wheels. And once those are in place, I'll start replacing the bridges.
I keep checking that the wheels are spinning freely as I go. I want to ensure that there's no binding. And that looks pretty good. Continuing on, I'll replace the ratchet wheel, then the crown wheel and its core, lubricating as I go. The click and that long click spring gets screwed into place.
And this little screw will keep the crown and stem in place later on. Now it's time for the keyless works, which consists of the winding pinion and the sliding clutch. Then this piece goes on. I'm not sure if you noticed earlier, but this is a pin set or nail set movement. And this piece transfers the motion from depressing the pin to put the watch into hand setting mode. And these two intermediate wheels uh, help transfer the winding of the crown and to the movement of the hands. So now I'll flip the movement back over to the train side and install the pallet for me. But before I install the pallet fork bridge, it also has a capstone. So I want to make sure that I clean that. Look how tiny this screw is compared to my finger. Just amazing. And this was made in the 1880s.
And I almost cross-thread that little sucker. And now it's time for the balance assembly, but you'll remember that I have to have the escape wheel bridge out of the way in order to get it fitted. And here I'm looking to make sure that I get the hairspring between the regulator pins. And that looks good. So with the movement mostly together, let's turn attention back to the case. And I'll just run that through the ultrasonic cleaner. The owner wants to keep it looking just the way it is, so no polishing, just clean. The dial is in good shape, so just some light cleaning with some water and a Q-tip. So I ordered a new crystal and that goes in next. Okay, so now we come to that cannon pinion that I broke. This took me three months of searching, but I finally found a suitable replacement. Now, it's not a perfect match. The inner diameter is slightly smaller than the original, so I'll have to use some brooches to widen that tapered hole. So in order to get it ready to be worked, I first had to make the hardened steel soft again, and this is called annealing. To do this, I heat up the piece to cherry red and keep it there for a time and then slowly let it cool back down. Don't quench it. This made the steel dark again. 
but that's just cosmetic. Then I put it into a pin vise and used a little bit larger brooches to slowly widen the hole to the size I needed. And to keep me from going too far, I put a little piece of green tape on the brooch. This took quite a bit of time because it's so important that I get it right the first time. And I kept checking it, and slowly but surely, I got to the point that was just right. What a relief. So with the new cannon pinion fitted, I can continue on. I actually had to press the cannon pinion on with my staking set, which unfortunately I didn't get footage of. My apologies. Now I can add the motion works and the dial and then get this movement recased. I'll insert the crown and the stem and give it a little wine. And look at that, it starts right up on its own. That's what I like, a real self-starter. Now I'll just install the hands and make sure they don't touch each other.
So if you stuck with me this far, I thank you. This has really been such a fun watch to work on. And with it being 18 karat solid gold, it is by far the most expensive watch I've worked on. We had our ups and our downs and our ups again. We changed out a broken cap jewel, put the hairspring right, replaced the crystal and refit the new cannon pin. This watch definitely taught me some things. I feel very honored to be a part of this watch's history and really proud that I was able to overcome that cannon pinion issue and to have such a great result. I do have to thank Stian from Vintage Watch Services for his advice and guidance on that issue. I really hope you enjoyed coming on this journey with me and seeing this great watch and hearing its story. If you liked what you've seen, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe and like the video. I have many great ideas and many watches coming in this year, so I hope you join me for a great 2023. So until next time, stay safe and God bless.